Well, tonight we're going to be in Psalm 114 and Psalm 115. Let's open our Bibles if you haven't already. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 114. And uh, we'll read the entire psalm, seeing that it's only eight verses, and we'll get into it together. Psalm 114, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist writes, When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the little hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you fled, O Jordan, that you turned back? O mountains, that you skipped like rams, O little hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. Now, this is a song of praise. As a matter of fact, it's part of a section that is dedicated to the praise of the Lord. When you look at these particular psalms, especially Psalms 113 to 118, that section is called the Egyptian Hallels. That's a, uh, the word halal is the Hebrew word for praise. It's a song of praise. And these were the psalms that were recited at various feast days. They would be recited at Passover. They would be recited during Pentecost. They would be recited uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles as well as the Feast of Dedication. This particular psalm that we're looking at is written to celebrate God's deliverance, the deliverance of the nation of, uh, of Israel from uh, bondage in Egypt. And it was used as a reminder. This psalm is used as a reminder so that the children of Israel might remember that God has delivered them in the past, and therefore it was reminding them that God would encourage them and that God loved them. And we need to understand, even as Psalm 114 is used as a reminder, we need to understand that the Scripture is given to us in order that we might be reminded of the works of God on our behalf too. The Bible tells us very clearly that that is so, that the Scriptures are written for us in order that we might be encouraged by what God has done in the past. Because when you see what God has done in the past, it gives you hope for your present and gives you security for your future, you see. And so the Bible tells us very clearly that the, the Word of God is intended to instruct us and encourage us in that way. Paul in 1 Corinthians in the New Testament in chapter 10, verse 11, said it this way. He said, all these things happened to them, speaking of the nation of Israel, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul said, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so somebody says, what's the point of reading the Bible? Well, the Bible tells us in itself it'll give us hope, it'll give us encouragement, it strengthens us. There are lessons that we can learn from the Word of God, and, and it admonishes us in order that we might live a, a life uh, with a full recognition that we're living in the last days. The Lord Jesus Christ is returning, and therefore we ought to be busy at our Master's business. So as we look at Psalm 114, it's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of praise how that the Lord has delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. We know also that in the Old Testament, you have the reality of the deliverance from bondage, which in the New Testament, very often the Egyptian bondage is recognized as being a picture or a type of the bondage that we ourselves suffer when we have failed to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and remain in bondage of sin. As we watch the Lord deliver the children of Israel, we have opportunity of realizing that He delivers us too. As we recognize that the children of Israel were in bondage or in slavery, we too recognize that we at one time were slaves, that we were slaves to sin. We at one time, in other words, were under another's control. We had another master, and the master treated us harshly. But the Lord Jesus Christ, in that he came and laid his life down for us, the Bible teaches very clearly, he purchased us, he redeemed us, he bought us out of the marketplace of slavery. That's what the word redemption means, and the cost of redemption is his blood. So he paid to set us free. He paid the cost, the ransom, in order that we might have a relationship with him, that we might be set free. And so as we look at this particular psalm, it helps us to remember that though this is related to the children of Israel, it also pertains to us because we too have been in bondage and we too have been set free. And so in verses 1 and 2 as we begin, it says simply, when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, Judah became a sanctuary and Israel his dominion. And so this speaks of Israel being delivered from the bondage of Egypt. The people of strange language simply speaks of a language other than their own. 
They were Hebrews. They spoke the language of the Hebrew, and they were there in Egypt listening to a language that was other than their own. And so they were there in bondage, and we know through Scripture that they were there for over 400 years in Egypt. And what happens is God delivers them. That's why in verse 2 it says, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. So the whole nation was to be God's tabernacle. The whole nation was to be the place where God would dwell. As a matter of fact, God's intent for the nation was that they be a nation of, of kings and priests. How do we know that? Well, in the Old Testament book of Exodus, in chapter 19, verse 6, uh, Moses said, uh, God inspiring him, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God intended to dwell amongst the people. As a matter of fact, they were to be his living witnesses, a living light and testimony to all the pagan nations surrounding them. They were unique in the economy of, of history at that time in that the Jews had a relationship with the, with the one God. If you look into ancient history, you will note that the children of Israel were unique in that they worshiped the one God over heaven and earth. Whereas the other nations surrounding them had multiple gods, the nation of Israel had the one God. And they were intended to be a light so that the, the nations around them would come to recognize that the God that they worshiped was the true God over the whole world. And so they were a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. They were to be those who were demonstrating that God had called them out of darkness. Now, what was true in the Old Testament is true in the New. Because the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, said this. He said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Even as the nation of Israel was intended by God to be his sanctuary, even so we are now. You are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. See, we're not religious people. I say that often because I want to emphasize that. We're not religious people, though the things that we do sometimes may be classified as religious. But what we really are are people who know our God. There's a difference between knowing about God or reading things about God or believing certain things about God and knowing God. There's a difference between having a religious preoccupation or being an individual who likes to do certain things like pray and like serve, even those are the things that we, we may do. But we fail to realize that, that God called us human beings. We are human beings, and, and sometimes what we are are human doings. I mean, we're busy doing things, but we're not being something. What God wants us to be is his chosen people. When you fall in love with the Lord and you are part of his royal kingdom, then the way that you're going to live is going to be entirely different. Why? Because he lives within you. Because his Holy Spirit inspires you, directs you, strengthens you, empowers you, guides you, you see. And what happens as we have come close to the Lord is God begins to move in us in a, in a particular way and people begin to recognize that there's something different about you. You see, when the Jesus Revolution uh, came about in the late 60s, early 70s and all, and, and when the big Jesus movement, that is continuing to this day, but when it began to get some uh, headlines and all, uh, we who are part of that uh, were individuals who, who came out of, some of us came out of religion in order that, order that we might have relationship with God. Some of us were practicing religionists. We had religion. We went to church sometimes. We believed in certain things. We had been taught certain things and all, but God wasn't dwelling inside of us. And when I was taught that you needed to be born again, that was absolutely mind-boggling to me. When I was taught that you needed to actually receive Christ as Lord and Savior through making a personal confession of sin and a reception by faith, inviting him to enter into my life, that I might be born again, that I might be a new creation, that blew my mind. But you want to know something? A lot of people haven't realized that even to this day. They still go to church on Sunday. They still get involved in various things. They still do those things because they're religious things to do. But they don't have a knowledge of God in their life. There's no sense of Jesus Christ in them. They're not in love with the Lord. I would ask you today, if you are, I would ask you today, if you love Jesus Christ, not, not church, not, not reading the Bible, not doing religious things, you know, human doings. No, I'm saying, do you have a relationship with the Lord? That's really an important question to ask. Sometimes people may think that's even an intrusive question, but it is indeed an important question to ask. I knew a young lady, a very beautiful young lady, a great girl, 
and uh, spoke to her. And on the first time she came to a Bible study, she came and she was just a good girl, great gal, very moral person, very loving, very generous. Um, didn't know the Lord. I asked her, how long have you been uh, a Christian? And she says, all my life. And there's no way you can be a Christian all your life because you're not born, born again. There's a time in your life that you receive Christ. This was a great gal and everything, but she didn't know the Lord. She needed to come to Christ. And that was my wife, Marie. I can still remember a young lady who uh, was coming to a, what we used to call a tri-F. I was in a, in a Baptist church and and we used to have fun, food, and fellowship. It was a young people's um, group that would gather together. And, and there was a young lady that was coming to the group and all. This is when I had just gotten out of the military. I was 22 years old, and her name was Gail. And I can remember her coming to my house one evening, and we hosted the Tri-F for this particular church I was, I was participating in. And uh, she had been in the church since she was 13. She was now at that time 19. She went on the retreats. She went in the college career class. Um, she'd been in the church for six years and, uh, you know, sang in the church choir. And I can remember I was seated there in my front room and Gail was seated there on the couch and I was visiting with her. And, and I can still remember turning to Gail and asking her a question. I said, Gail, when were you born again? And she looked at me and she says, I never have been. And I said, no, let me, let me get this straight. You've never been born again? She said, no. I said, how long have you been in the church? She said, since I was 13. I said, you're 19 now? Yes. You've been there six years? She said, yes. I said, and you've never been born again? She says, no, I never have. I said, may I ask you a question? She said, yes. I said, why? Why haven't you been born again? You know what her answer was? It was amazing to me. She said, nobody's ever asked me to be born again. Six years in the church, singing in the choir, all of her friends, who happened to be my friends, assumed that she was a Christian because she went to church. And I was the outsider who joined the group, so I was the one to ask the question. So I asked her, when were you born again? Her answer, never have been. My response, would you like to be born again? She said, I sure would. I said, would you pray with me? And she said, yes, and I, and I led her to the Lord. But you know, it's an amazing thing. Then I went and spoke to the people, and I said, you know what Gail just did? She just received Christ as her Lord and Savior, and they kind of looked at me with this blank stare like, yeah, so what? I mean, we're here for fun, food, and fellowship, man. What's this evangelism going on here at the Triumph? It was really an interesting group to be part of. But the bottom line is there are people who go to church, even churches like this, who have never been confronted with the question, are you the sanctuary of the Spirit of God? God intended the children of Israel to be that, and that's why in verse 2 he says, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. Verse 3, the sea sawed and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the little hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? O mountains that you skipped like rams, O little hills like lambs. So notice how he says in verse 3, the sea saw it and fled, and Jordan turned back. Not only did the children of Israel, as they were leaving Egyptian bondage, not only did they cross the Red Sea, we're all familiar with that story. And I allude to that quite often, especially as we go through the Psalms, because it's pointed out often. But not only did they cross the Red Sea, but they also needed to cross the Jordan River. You know the story of how they were there at the Red Sea, how that the Egyptian chariots were behind them, God separating them, protecting them from the Egyptian chariots, how that God caused a strong wind to hit the Red Sea, how it parted, how the land was dry, and the children proceeded across the Red Sea upon dry ground. But what's interesting, when you study how they entered into the uh, Promised Land across the Jordan River, it's recorded in Joshua chapter 3. What's interesting, and I want to read this to you, just a couple of verses in Joshua 3. In verse 13, uh, the Lord was speaking to them and saying that they were going to cross the Jordan and enter into the land. But in Joshua chapter 3, verse 13, it says, It shall come to pass, listen, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand up as a heap. In Joshua 3, 17, the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. 
and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. The Red Sea had the wind blowing on it and dried it, but the Jordan required the priests to stand in the water to actually touch it, and as their feet hit the water, it parted before them, which gave us an insight into one that God is the one who parts it, but God intends for us to step out in faith. In the first instance, they were there petrified at the uh, shoreline. In the second instance, he says, now the priests have to lead you in faith, and therefore they'll step into that water. And can you imagine what the priests must have been thinking as they were bearing the ark with them and they began to step into it? They were probably thinking, boy, I hope this water parts before us as the Lord said it would. And there it does. It opens up, and then the children of Israel crossed. As a matter of fact, the priests remained there, standing there until everybody had crossed it. And so they're reminding, he's reminding through the history that God has led them through the Red Sea as well as the Jordan River, that God has been there to deliver them. When he says in verses 4 through 6 that the mountains skip like rams and the little hills like lambs, he's actually asking nature why it reacted as it did. It's doing that to illustrate to us the fact that nature is obedient to God. As a matter of fact, it's been said that nature is more obedient to God than man is because God speaks and it obeys. And so he's illustrating that to us. And he's obviously demonstrating to us that our God is the God of nature. And so in verse 7, he says, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. When he's speaking of the rock and when he's speaking about the flint, he's speaking about the two instances when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness that God brought water from the rock. And he's reminding them of how the Lord did that on two different occasions. Now, we remember that the Lord had spoken to Moses and said to him in the first instance in Exodus chapter 17, when they were at Horeb, he had said to, to, the, to Moses, because the children of Israel are saying, we don't have any water, God said, strike the rock and it'll bring forth water. And so as Moses did so in front of the people, struck the rock, and the water began to uh, pour out water, and it was sufficient enough to, to water uh, the needs of two million-plus people plus their livestock. Now, in the second instance, the children of Israel once again were complaining against the Lord. It's recorded in Numbers chapter 20, and they were at a place called Kadesh, and while they were there once again, they were crying out, saying, uh, we are perishing for lack of water, and uh, Moses on that particular instance got angry and misrepresented the Lord. And you know the story. God said, speak to the rock, and it'll produce water. But that isn't the way Moses did it. Moses walked up to it, and he said, you rebels, must we cause water to come out of this rock? And he smote it uh, twice. And in doing so, God says, you misrepresented me. And what he was doing is he was representing God as being angry with the children of Israel. Not only that, and God wasn't, not only that, but that rock we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is Christ, which is a picture of what Jesus was for us and is for us in that he was smitten one time. He died one time for all time. So he was smitten the one time and produces the water of life. And so when we approach him for salvation and all, we just ask him and he produces for us and gives to us from him himself the, the water of eternal life, you see. Moses didn't represent the Lord properly, and in doing so, he remained outside of the promised land. And so he's basically here in Psalm 114 reminding the children of Israel how God has delivered them in the past. And for us, it's a picture that he continues to do so to this day. Psalm 115, beginning at verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord... Not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, where now is their God? The psalm is highlighting the confidence that the community of faith has in the Lord. They may have a need, but they also have faith to know that God is the one who will meet that need. And the faith in his goodness that they have to provide provokes them to praise. The bottom line is he's pointing out to us that God is sovereign and God should be praised. The false gods of the heathen are nothing. They're devoid of power to help. And because of that, all people should put their trust in the Lord. Now, in verse 1, when he says that, unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. This is one of the scriptures that the Lord gave to me uh, a number of years ago that is refreshing for me to be able to just look at again tonight. Because in, in service to the Lord, the bottom line is, and this is something all of us can practically understand if you serve the Lord, 
The bottom line is this, is that whenever you do something, it ought to be done for the Lord and not for yourself. There are some people who do things just for the glory of it. There are some people who have selfish ambition who hope to somehow be able to, uh, to receive honor and glory for the things that they do, even when it's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the things that I'm learning and have learned in the past and continue to hope to learn in the future is this. When you serve the Lord, it ought to be all for Him and nothing for you. You know, whenever I give uh, an invitation in this church or wherever it is that I do, uh, and, and we, we bow our heads and we begin to pray, and I'm, and I'm asking people to get right with the Lord and giving them an opportunity to do so. As all of us are praying, I can tell you what I'm doing at that time. I'm, I'm saying, Lord, if there's anything in me that would in any way, shape, or form hinder somebody from coming to a faith in you, if there's anything in me that would keep somebody from getting right with you, anything that, that would tarnish your word, or Lord, forgive me for whatever that might be. I don't want that. When I come out uh, uh, to, to teach, I'll stand at the door and, and, and all. And I know that uh, the reason you all stand, and, and some people may wonder, how come we all stand? What, are we giving honor to David? Well, sure, of course, why not? No, I mean, <laughs> when I'm standing there, what that is is my cue, so I know it's time to come out. You know, that's basically what it is. People may not realize that, but let me tell you what that is. It's my cue, because I don't know when the song's going to conclude. You know, so I'll be there listening to music because I'm on the other side of the door there, you know. And, um, and so I've instructed our music ministers, when, you, when it's time for me to come out, have them stand. That way I know they're standing. I'm actually standing there waiting, and, and, our, and our cameramen are instructed so, to look at you, to pan uh, the congregation so I can see if you're standing because that's, I need to know that so I can come out. Plus, you've been sitting down for 15 or 20 minutes, and it's good to get the blood circulating a little so that when I come out, I can put you back to sleep, you know, and that's just kind of how it works. And so as I'm standing there and I'm waiting, you know, for, for that, uh, that, that time to come out, as I stand at the door, I'll be praying, Father, in Jesus' name, as I go out, may your word go forth in a way that instructs your people. That comes right out of this verse here. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. One of the problems, I think, today in ministry is uh, the minister too often is given the glory that really belongs to the Lord. And we have our own, you know, hierarchy of heroes and all, when the only hero you really need is Jesus himself. And so that's the point. Because of your mercy, because of your truth, we want to give you glory. In verse 2, why should the Gentiles say, where now is their God? They're in trouble, in other words, and, and, and in God not delivering them in a timely fashion, it gives to the Gentiles an opportunity to mock God and to mock their faith in Him. Psalm 42, verse 3 says, My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, Where is your God? And very often that's the question of the unbeliever. Where was God? Where was God when this happened? Where is God now? Look at your life right now. What's going on? There have been many times when I've been going through something that may be strong or severe, and, and somebody might wonder, what's keeping you up? What keeps me up is my faith in the Lord and the fact that the Lord carries me. That's what it is. And sometimes people will say, well, where is your God? Well, my God is here right now. My God is with me, and my God is good, and he's going to take care of the situation, and I trust him. I remember a, a lady I used to teach a Bible study, the first Bible study I used to teach there in, uh, in Norwalk. Her name was Claudette. Claudette had a young boy, her little boy had just been born, and he was only a couple of years old. He was very ill. And Claudette came to the house, and, and she was a member of the Bible study I was, I was teaching and all, and I remember her uh, speaking to me on one occasion, and she says, I've been praying for little Ernie, and Ernie's not getting well. And she asked me the question. She said, little Ernie's not getting well. She goes, where is God now? And I'll never forget the answer I gave to her. I said, he's in the same place he was when he watched his son die on a cross, Claudette. In the same place, he hasn't moved. He hears your cry. He knows your need. You have to trust him. And that's how it works, guys. He hasn't moved. The, the pagan says, where is your God? But we know where our God is. Now, he moves on, and this is interesting. He says in verse 3, our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. So instead of us trying to figure out why God has or has not acted in a certain way, we simply trust him. And what causes me to trust him is one simple reality, and this is something that, that the Lord has taught me I want to give to you, and perhaps you'll learn the same thing or have learned the same thing. Why do I trust him? I trust him because he's good. I trust him because he's good. That's why I trust him. 
my, um, God is very gracious to me. My water heater developed a leak. And I mean, it's just, it was it's just pooling up underneath the water heater at home and, and it was dripping over and, and God is very good to me. My son-in-law is a plumber. <laughs> and um, so I whined to him a couple of days ago. I said, Dave, could you check out that and tell me what's wrong with the water heater? And he came out and he said, you know what, it's messed up. And he, he started telling me what was wrong with it. He said, you know what, I can get you a new water heater and I'll put it in for you. So today he did that, this, this, this afternoon and early evening. He put in my water heater for me and, and I stood out there in the garage and I watched him lug it around and I watched him do all the work and I said, yeah, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> and as he was doing it, my grandson was there. And I watch my grandson as he's playing in the garage, and he, 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 he likes to clean things up, so he has a little broom, and he's cleaning up the garage and everything, and he's just having a great old time with us. And, uh, but, you know, when he's, when he's running around, I'm running behind him. I'm right behind him every step of the way. If he, if he bumps into something, uh, I'm there to catch him. And, and my son-in-law has a pickup truck, and the tailgate was down, and it happens to be the same height as my, my, my Josiah's head. And Josiah was running straight at the tailgate. But before he could get to it, I put my hand over it like that so he hits my hand instead of the tailgate. The Lord uses these things in my life, and I pick them up and I put them down and I hover over them and care for them. I'm giving you that illustration just to show you how wonderful I am. No, I'm giving you that illustration <laughs> to show you that if I, being an evil man, care about my grandbaby, to hover over and protect him, and I'm not a good man. I'm an evil man. And if I am as an evil man just in love with him and I want to protect him from any harm, then it, it's easy for me to believe in a God who is, is a good God who loves me and protects me. And no matter what I go through, whatever it may be, it first had to sift through his will for my life. And there have been a lot of times, even like Jeremiah, that I've said, Lord, I want to speak to you concerning your judgments. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about why things are happening this way. Perhaps you need a little, little advice from me and all, and I'd like to give you some. You know, some of you have done the same thing, and, and ultimately the Lord looks at you and says, may I ask where you were when I set all things in motion? Can I ask a few questions of you if you want to ask me, just like he does in the book of Job, chapters 38 through 41? where ultimately in chapter 42, Job gets to the point of saying, you know what, I'm an evil man. I put my hand over my mouth. You know, I sit in, in sackcloth and ashes. You know, I shouldn't have spoken. Uh, who am I to darken your counsel? Forgive me for calling your, 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 your ways into, into, uh, into question. The bottom line is this, and this scripture is so powerful. Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. My responsibility is to simply trust him. Psalm 135, verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. So we give glory to God because our God is in heaven and he's sovereign. But now in contrast, you have the gods of the, of the heathen. Verse 4, their gods are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. Eyes they have, but they don't see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. That's the sin of idolatry. They are plated with silver and gold, and they look like, uh, like a, 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 a human being, if you will, because they have eyes, they have ears, they have noses, they have mouths, they have hands, and they have feet, but they are immobile. They can do nothing to deliver you. One of my friends, Gary Ruff, who's a pastor of Calvary Chapel of Foothills, years ago, as a joke, bought me uh, four little images. They're not idols. They're called homies. I don't know if you've ever seen the homies. Perhaps you have. He gave me four of them. I've got two girls and two boys, and I've got a Rottweiler that is supposed to belong to little David. And so these are, these are four little homies, you know, two girls and two boys and all of that. 
And then one of the guys in the church, when I had mentioned that once before, thought it was funny. All of a sudden, I started getting all of these homies, so I've got my whole gang now in my back right over there. I've got a 37 Chevy and the whole nine yards, you know. I've got Silky and Sad Girl and Little Savage. I mean, I've got them all, you know, spooky. They're all there in the back right now, you know. So say I get in trouble and I'm driving down the street, you know, and I've got Little Savage in my pocket, you know, and I pull him up, oh, Little Savage, help me. I mean, we'd all laugh over that because that's just a little guy who's been, you know, made out of plastic or rubber or whatever. We understand that, but that's the point he's making. He's saying, when you have an idol, he said, it may have a human-like appearance. It may even have valuable substances like gold and silver that's plated over the wood. You create it in such a way that it has eyes, it has ears, eyes that can't see and ears that can't hear. It's got a nose that can't smell. It's got a mouth that can't speak. It's got a hand that can't reach you and feet that can't come after you. And those who make them are like them. They're helpless. And the point he's making is idolatry is foolish. We have a God in heaven who is alive. That's the point that he's making. And the heathen's God is made from, from their own hands and according to their own likeness. Our God is the uncreated creator. He exists from all eternity. But their God is the work of their own hands and are unable to deliver them in their time of need. That's what Isaiah is pointing out in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 14 through 17. And he speaks about the man who worships an idol. He says he cuts down cedars for himself, takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image it fall and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire, and with this half he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I'm warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worship it, worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. That's, that's what he's pointing out. He's saying they are, they are made out of men's hands. That's what he says in verse 4. They are the work of men's hands. But what is interesting is verse 8, those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. You become like what, we, what you worship. When you worship the Lord, God, the word that will be used to describe you is godly. When you're worshiping Jesus Christ, the word that is used to describe you is Christ-like or Christian. When you are aware of the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the words that are used to describe you are spirit-filled. Because what you worship, you become like. Godly, Christ-like, spirit-filled. But when you worship, an idol, that's what you become like. So whatever it is that you're best known for it represents really what you worship. And that's the point he's making. We have God and therefore give to God glory because of his mercy and because of his truth. Even when the pagans say, where is your God? Our God is in heaven, does whatever he pleases. He's not at my, my beck and call, I'm at his. But you, on the other hand, he's saying to the idolaters, well, you create something. You create an idol that's unliving and expected to deliver you. But the fact of the matter is it can't because it has no power to do so. Verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, which speaks of the priests, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So Israel's God is worthy of being trusted because he protects his people and he helps them. And trusting in the Lord is to be preferred over trusting in false gods. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord, there's strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. Verse 12 and 13, the Lord has been mindful of us. In other words, he has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. The bottom line is, and you need the context here, the questions being asked, where is your God? That reveals to us there's a time of affliction or some kind of 
a struggle that they're going through. So the bottom line is, when he tells us in verse 12 that he remembers us, it's to remind us that God who remembers us will also bless us. Godly people, in other words, go through afflictions like anybody else. And we aren't exempted from the experiences that are common to mankind. In 1 Peter, in chapter 4, verse 12, Peter said it this way. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. You see, sometimes believers, when you're first born again, you, everything's going so well and all, but when you begin to encounter a trial or an affliction, it may cause you to stumble. You may be getting to the point where you say, I don't even think it's worth this. I don't think it's worth following the Lord. I mean, it, it seemed like I was happier before I had him. You know, Friday night comes, and I've got nobody who wants to hang around with me anymore because all my friends want to go to the club or party somewhere. And, and me, now that I'm born again, I'm by myself constantly. I got nothing to do. You know, before it seemed like I had friends everywhere. Now it seems like I'm alone. Or before I got saved, you know, everything was going fine for me. Now on the job that everybody knows that I'm a Christian, well, they don't want anything to do with me, and now they're mocking me, and it was easier before I got saved than it is right now. Affliction hits us all. I remember when I got saved, I, I, I came home, I was filled with joy, everything was going good until about the fourth day, and then I had my first trial. And I was amazed. I thought that, man, the minute I got saved, everything would be just great from that point on. I'd never have a bad day again. I'd never have a struggle. And I discovered that that's just not true at all, that the Lord will bring a, a, a trials into your life. He allows affliction into your life just like anybody else because everybody goes through storms in life. Everybody goes through storms, including those who love the Lord. It's how we respond to those storms that really demonstrates what we believe, and that's what God would have for us. God would give to us an ability to understand who he is in order that we might have strong foundations in our life. And in the last few years in my walk with the Lord have been the deepening times of the Lord that I've never experienced before, and I'm growing closer to him and drawing closer to him almost on a daily basis now through the variety of things that he allows into my life. And it causes me to remember something Jesus taught us. Keep in mind, there's no guarantee that you and I, that we will not go through hard times. As a matter of fact, it seems sometimes that we go through hard times even more so sometimes than other people. But that's one of the ways that character is developed in you. That's one of the ways that hope and perseverance is developed in you. You know, I, I remember hearing somebody say, well, I was asking the Lord if he would give me patience. And man, I started going through so many trials, I can't believe it. I don't want to have any more patience. I don't want patience. And the only people who really pray for patience are doctors. The rest of us really don't want patience, <laughs> you know. How are you going to get patience? You go through trials. You go through things that, that cause you to have to exercise it, and that's how it works. And as you're exercising and growing and learning to die to things, and the stress levels that we Californians live through are, 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 are lethal, really. As we learn to cast our cares on the Lord, He works in our life. But the bottom line is, and we know this, uh, we go through things the way everybody else does. That The difference is, is where's your foundation? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, and Jesus is speaking in that particular portion of Scripture. And Jesus says this, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The believer and the non-believer alike went through the same storm. The difference is the foundation. The believer is built on the rock, Jesus Christ and his sayings, his word. The non-believer, their life is built on sinking sand. And so I was 23 years old, 24 years old. I was working for this guy, small business. I used to work in his warehouse. I was his only employee. He had two young boys and, and his wife, and he was kind of an intellectual. 
I was going to Biola at the time, and he liked to hire Christians to work for him because we wouldn't steal from him. And so I was working for him, and I was in the front office one day, and he was in his rear office, and it was time for me to leave, and I walked into the back. And as I walked into the back office there, I looked, and he had a small bookshelf. He had a variety of books there, and, and all psychology books and a variety of other books, and I was looking at them. And I said, oh, you're a reader. And he says, oh, yes. And I said, you like to read? And he said, yeah. And so we began to speak, and I said, um, I said, are you a Christian man? I, you, you like to hire guys from Biola? And he says, no, I'm not a Christian. I just hire you guys because you're honest. I said, good. I said, but what do you have in life? What do you have going for you? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, what do you have in life? What's, what's happening in you? Where's your foundation? He says, well, you know, I'm happy. He says, I'm very happy. I really don't need the Lord. And I said, oh, really? And I said, you're happy because your wife is faithful. You're happy because your business is prosperous. You're happy because you've got two small children who give you joy. What's going to happen if your wife is unfaithful? What's going to happen if your business goes down the tubes? What's going to happen if your children grow up and rebel against you? Are you still going to be happy? I said, listen, the word happy is derived from the word happenings, which derives from circumstances, and therefore you're happy because your circumstances are prosperous. Everything's going fine for you. But what's going to happen when your circumstances are not that good? Because Jesus Christ gives to us something that you have right now will not give to you. Jesus Christ doesn't make us happy. Jesus Christ gives us joy. And joy comes from a knowledge of who God is and a relationship with Him. You know, I used to do that to my bosses. That's why I got fired so often. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. Isn't it true? You can have all great things going for you, but what happens when those things begin to blow up one by one in your face? And everything is taken from you, all the things you trusted in, all the things you thought would make you successful, all the things you thought you needed in order to be successful. So you got the house, you got the good relationship, you got the, the nice car, you got the great clothes, you got everything you wanted, but inside you're still empty. Why is that? Why is that? It's because you don't have the Lord. So God is a blessing God. He remembers us, and He blesses those who fear Him. And our lives are built on a solid rock, Jesus Christ, so no matter what happens, we still have Him. In verse 14, may the Lord give you increase more and more. You and your children, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth He has given to children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence, but we... We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. So the Lord, he says in verse 14, may the Lord give you increase. In other words, may God prolong you. May your generations be blessed. Interestingly enough, one of the signs that God was blessing you as a Jewish person under the Jewish economy was that you're, you might have children because for them, having many children was a sign of God's blessing. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the, the womb is a reward. When he says in verses 16 through 18, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth is given to the children of men. God is the maker of heaven and God is the maker of earth. It all belongs to him. It's all under his authority. And because he owns all things, he's not limited in power or in rule. He graciously gives to men the opportunity to have dominion over all created things. In Genesis 1.26, the Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, or over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Man is the pinnacle of God's creation. I heard somebody yesterday who represents Peta, and, um, not Peter, Peta, and, um, you know, the ethical treatment of animals and they have a, uh, some ad, an ad out that it, it, it makes the uh, Jewish Holocaust and the slaughter of animals for food, they're equating the slaughter of animals with the Holocaust of six million Jews. And they're advertising. And the reason they do this, and I listened to the entire argument and discussion, it was really an interesting one in the sense that, you know, just to hear how somebody really thinks and all, it's that they basically equate animal life with human life. Well, the Bible does not do that. One, Jesus was not a vegetarian. You know that. 
he ate the Passover lamb. He was not a vegetarian. Two, eating meat or not eating meat doesn't bring you closer to God. It's personal choices. If you want to be a vegetarian, that's great. Pass me your hamburger. I'll eat it for you. <laughs> and that's all right. I have no problem, but you're not better than me because you like veggie burgers. You're just different. <laughs> you know, and that's okay, too. I don't mind. I mean, I'm not going to tell you you're a bad person. As a matter of fact, that's fine. If that's your diet, I, I have no objection to that, of course. But it doesn't make you any better, and it doesn't make me worse because I like a steak or whatever. Of course it doesn't. So to equate human life and animal life is absolutely bizarre because the Bible does not do that. Jesus Christ came to redeem man, took upon himself human form, died on a cross for us and redeemed us. Now creation is under a curse and when God recreates all things, creation and the curse of creation will be dealt with. But you aren't any better or any worse because you do or do not eat certain foods and all. The Lord gave to us dominion. We have the responsibility of, of tilling the soil and producing, even if it's through the sweat of our brow. Fact is, God owns all things, but God gives to us the stewardship of the things that he possesses. And that's what he's speaking about when he speaks concerning that here in this particular portion of Scripture. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth is given to the children of men. In verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore praise the Lord. Now, it's interesting, and it says the dead do not praise the Lord. You might have somebody who believes in the cessation of existence of the human soul upon death. Some say there's an annihilation. Some say there is soul sleep. Jehovah's Witnesses will say to you that, uh, that there's an annihilation. There's no such place as, as, as uh, hell. And so when a person dies in sin, they're basically annihilated, and that's basically the Jehovah's Witness teaching. They might even point to verse 17 here in Psalm 115 and say to you, notice it says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. And therefore they'll say, how can you say that somebody is going to be resurrected or continues to exist after he dies when the Scripture says the dead do not praise the Lord? The point he's making is the dead do not praise the Lord in that their voices are no longer heard on earth. That's the point that he's making. In other words, they can't join the festivals. They can't join the processions. They don't go to the temple any longer. But we believers, we praise the Lord forevermore. That's what it says in verse 18. We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. It's interesting how Jesus in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, said this. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Shall never die. Now, isn't that an interesting phrase? Shall never die. D.L. Moody once said one day, and this is a paraphrase, once, when, one day you're going to be reading, the evangelist D.L. Moody has died. He says, do not believe it, because at that moment I will be more alive than I have ever been. Why are you saying that, D.L. Moody? Well, I'm saying that because at that point, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So we who are born again have eternal life. Life is not simply a duration of time. Life is a quality, and it comes through relationship with God. When you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, though this body will be planted yet we are still alive. We are very alive because we've been born again and thus we're transported into the presence of God. And so what he's speaking about here when he says in verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, he's speaking about their voices being heard on earth any longer in the processions, in the temple, and the various other things. But when he says in verse 18, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore praise the Lord, the fact of the matter is God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living because even as Jesus said in Luke 20, 38, all live to him. And so as you begin to praise the Lord here on earth, that praise that you've begun to learn to give here on earth continues through eternity. You and I will continue to praise the Lord into eternity. And people who don't like to worship the Lord here on earth would not find heaven to be a suitable place for them because that's what you do all the time when you're in heaven is you praise the Lord. And so what I've tried to do is I've tried to learn to do that here on earth so I'm used to it by the time I get there. And when I do get there, 
That's what we'll be doing for eternity is praising the Lord. And I sure look forward to seeing him face to face one day. Don't you?